I'm at Muskinek on Gorge today. We're going to be doing a, maybe about two miles here, starting on the Yellow Trail, which is also part of the Highlands. Working our way across the top of the waterfall, down, and then back to the parking lot. Um, probably take about two hours. This would be a classified difficult trail. Um, the water crossings especially. And then of course you're dealing with a major slope in this park. Um, with that being said, we'll get started. Hopefully the call you're hearing is that of the red-eyed Vireo. It's often compared to the sound of the robin. What I hear is a game of hide and seek going on with the birds saying, here I am, where are you? It's a nondescript bird up in the trees with a red eye, um, gray body, white eye line. Back in the Sarolands walk, I talked about May Apple, poor man's umbrella. Um, it's now in the middle of May, or I should say two thirds of the way in May. And there's some May Apple here in the park and I'm just showing off what one of the flowers looks like. Okay, hopefully you just heard that call. That's a flycatcher. Just went again. Um, it's the Eastern Wood Peewee. Looks like the Eastern Phoebe. Habitat can be used as one of the clues as to which one. The Peewee will, the Peewee will never really be in a developed area. It needs the forest stand. Phoebe often nests under eaves and bridges or some other structure. Um, they look very similar, the peewee being a bit more drab. Just trying to show you the forest habitat of Muskie. It is a very healthy stand. Um, it's often said the f least dip amount of distance you can see, or I'm saying that wrong, the shorter the distance you can see into the woods, um, the healthier the forest. Muskie has a very strong herb layer plants that grow up every year and then die back. There is a shrub layer, small trees, and then the upper canopy. You kind of break it up into a four-story structure, so to speak, with the various layers. And again, the herbaceous and shrub layer give it clear indication, really, to the strong health of the forest. Um, because again, deer and other animals um, even some exotic plant material destroy the ground floor and then we're left with a very open forest not providing much habitat for the wildlife. Here that's not the case. All the levels are here present and very strong. Okay, flying around in front of me doing its business is a bumblebee. It's not a honeybee. Honeybees are more yellow. Um, these are a bit more solitary um, with more black in the abdomen. It's going out searching for flowers. 
um, to collect pollen. They still make their honey. Um, it's using a series of holes here, so it might be an underground hive for the bumblebee. I'll see if it comes out one more time. But again, that's the hole. Um, there's some old flowers here laying on the ground, but I'm assuming it's going after some other things. Um, but I don't see it coming back out. I know it may be kind of hard to see, but there's a really flat area in front of me. You can also see that there's a very dark color to the trail tread. This is an old charcoal landing in the park. Um, it's flat up to where the fallen tree is. It's also an open area within the forest. This was man-made. Um, it was made out of charcoal because as I mentioned I think in the Jugtown video no forest landscape is virgin in Hunterdon County everything's been cut and that includes Muskinetcon Gorge down below us on the Muskinetcon River is the old paper mill and the trees up here on the slope were all cut to feed the paper mill because of the slope they burnt trees to create um, ash and made flat areas to work and cut on the trees on. And then set the trees and the charcoal down to the paper mill for processing. There are a few of these around, but if memory serves, this is really the only one on the trail system. Okay, hopefully you just heard that sound. Um, there's a couple other things calling. Chipmunk. Red-eyed Vireo. But that dry trail is actually one of the Wurblers people go out searching for called Worm-Eating Wurbler. If you heard something similar to this near a parking lot or around your house, chances are you're hearing that of the chipping sparrow. But there is a close chipmunk with a single chirp. And the here I am where are you sound is coming from behind me. But again, worm eating warbler. Okay, this little sapling in front of me is one of the common trees throughout Muskinetcon Gorge. It's pignut hickory. I'm picking on this one because hickory trees are actually one of the compound leaves. This whole stem that I'm holding is actually one leaf. The bud is back here on the main branch where the stem forks off. So this whole stem is the leaf. Each one of these five sections, which you might think is a leaf, is referred to as a leaflet. Mocker nut, pig nut, and shagbark hickory are all present, but not the dominant tree in Muskinetcon Gorge. Okay, this is the creek that run, first creek that runs through Muskinetcon Gorge. There is a second, about three more miles out. It's also the top of the waterfall, and you can see the start of the drop maybe over there with a little bit of white water. But this is a intersection. The blue trail is off to, the, I'm sorry, the gas line road trail, the flag blue is off to that point. In front of me, if you can see the steps, is the continuation of the ridge trail. 
the Highlands Trail. I won't be going that way, uh, not because of the slope, but a time factor. You would add about another two hours if you were going to go out all the way to the switchback to do a loop. And then you've got about an 800 foot elevation change. But again, this is one of the more challenging spots because we do have to rock hop or wet foot it to get across the creek. Um, so you do need to be aware of that um, when you come in. Okay, again, this is the top of the waterfall. Uh, as you can see, it's not one giant fall, but it falls in a series of steps. Wherever you see some white water, it's a significant fall. Um, it drops, I think, close to 200 feet when all is said and done. The largest step might be about 20, 25 feet. It's a beautiful area, nice and serene. Um, best flowing after we've had some rainwater to give it a, a recharge, but there's always some kind of water moving here. The creek, I don't think has an official name because of an old tr interpreter trail that's been let go years and years ago. Um, I do know in-house we refer to it as Scout Run. The waterfall area from below. Again, pictures are not, will not do it justice. To hear the water and be here is a different thing. Okay, this is one of the other native shrubberies within um, Muskinecon Gorge. I know there's some also hidden along the creek at the Arboretum. But this is witch hazel, has a very distinctive leaf. By fall, it will get attacked by an aphid and create sort of this cone-shaped structure growing out of the leaf known as witch hazel's gall. With kids, we would joke about it um, being where the witches are hiding before Halloween. But it's actually one of the shrubs that can actually bloom early in the season, February, March. Um, so it does have a little bit of mystery to it. But again, it's just one of the broader leaves you might see along your trail hike at eye level. This is the railroad trail. It goes out to the base of the switchback. Um, this is the trail public needs to hike. There is a gate that you'll see nearby that opens up to an old spur line for the paper mill. As much as an wa easy walk as it looks like it can provide, you do need to know that it's not county park land. And if you are walking it, you are technically trespassing. General rule is if you see the yellow diamonds um, for the property line and can read them, you either have walked out of the county parkland or you're walking along the, the road systems that exist around the county parks. So again, take the railroad trail out to the switchback or come back on it. It's where you'll find some seeps and um, I have found a rare tree called striped maple. And I am going to detour on it. It'll add about 40 minutes to my hike, but I'll show you off those two items to you. This is one of the seeps within Muskinecon Gorge. Um, water perking out of the ground near the trail. 
Um, you can see the skunk cabbage around. In the right time of year, I've had some luck hunting amphibians here. It's a little later in the season. American toads, a couple species of salamanders have all been found here. You can see how the water's been draining out onto the trail and making it wet. Um, so again, it, you just need to be aware that you might hit some wet areas if you do all the way out to the switchback because I'm currently on the railroad trail. Just This is one of the things I wanted to show off that I just didn't encounter on the other part of the trail. Okay, hopefully this is coming out. Um, but this is the bark of a rare maple in the park. You do have to hike to find it. I'm really at the base of the switchback trail, but this is called striped maple. If you can look at the bark, you'll see um, some what reminds me of like a green candy cane uh, striping occurring up and down on the bark. But it is a maple tree. Here's what the leaves look like. And again, the opposite branching structure of the tree. It's an understory. It is unique. Um, Muskinetkong is one of two locations I know that this tree occurs in. Um, but again, you have to be willing to go on a scavenger hunt to find it. And like I said, for this one, the clue is it's down near the base of the switchback trail. Okay, this is another understory tree that you might find in Muskinekon Gorge. It has a very peely bark. It's not common, but when you see it, it should stand out. But this is elm. One of the easiest ways to identify elm is when you look at the leaves, the base of the leaves um, to the stem don't meet up. One side extends a little bit longer than the other. Plus it's a very serrated leaf when you see it. Um, again, this has been re pushed into the understory. Um, the Elms disease way back when that was brought over from Europe in the colonial days did a major number on this tree. Usually what happens, they, they live 50 to 70 years and then they die back with the young saplings slowly replacing. They'll never really take their full presence in the forest again. Here's one of those witch hazel galls I was talking about on a different tree. Um, again, it looks like the point of the Wicked Witch's hat sticking out of the leaf. But inside it, um, insects are growing, living off the nutrients that are generated by the tree. Okay, this is the bottom creek crossing. Again, you have to rock walk. There is a bridge for one area. Again, um, there's a slope on the other side. It's just an area that, again, you need to be wearing proper footwear for and just take your time as you move through. It's not the easiest of trails. Okay, but I'm on the blue trail now, about 50 feet off at one point. There's at least two that can be found is a unique root structure for the black birch tree. What happened was initially the seed landed on top of a stump and germinated. It put out its roots in and around the stump and then continued to grow the tree. The stump is now gone 
and what you see is the remains of the root structure above ground that was on around and in the stump. It's something unique to birch trees that I know. I don't really see many other trees doing this except for a little bit of extended growth on the surface or in rockier areas where they're pushing into the ground from where the seed fell. But to be above ground, black birch is the only one that I know that does it. Okay, this flecking on the trunk of the tree is probably some woodpecker um, action. The tree is sassafras, and the reason why I stopped is you'll notice that the bark where it's been flecked actually has two tones to it. It's one of the forester's IDs for the tree of sassafras, which is an understory tree. The leaves aren't really out on it yet, um, but it's the one that has the nickname of the ghost. It has actually four different shapes to the leaf. The trilobe, the oval, a right mitten, and a left mitten. Um, if you rip the leaves, you'll get a sense of fruit loops to them. But again, if the bark was shaved, the inner bark is two colors. This is the spur off the blue trail. It's a one-way trail to Bellis and Cypress Road intersection. Um, if you do the hike, you need probably an hour one way and then to return another hour. Um, it's a relatively new trail, about two, three years old now. Um, I really can't speak much about wildlife on it because I really haven't done it enough yet. So it's a new trail to explore on your own.